Could you imagine Flaherty Ooh. going to the Pirates? When I saw that report, I was like, Jack Flaherty has to have better options I guarantee than the Pirates. Th- there's no way the Pirates are his best option. Right. I'm just saying that was reported that, okay, if he doesn't get a multi-year deal, I'm just thinking if I'm Jack Flaherty, what type of multi-year deal for you makes sense to actually sign? If you could go two years, right? But if I'm him, I would want an option just because what if he's really good? Agreed. But even if you can't two years, you still have room to make a lot of money. So, yeah. You know, he's still in that prime earning age. But if a lot of teams don't want to, I guarantee there's a team that has a better chance to win that'll give him one year. Right? How about a good, this is a good question, I think. You can correct me if I'm wrong. That I, I think we haven't posed this. Now that the Cardinals, so they have Sonny Gray, everybody, everybody agrees that he's front end, right? Fair to say? One, two, whatever it is. Yeah. He's yeah. front end. He's their only real front end guy. Would you rather have had Flaherty back on a one-year deal for similar money as opposed to Lynn or Kyle Gibson? If you could have got him for basically the same Ooh. price, let's say the second year is an option, let's say the first year is $10, 11000000 million, whatever it was. Okay. So here's my thing. Instead of one of the guys, like, maybe. But the, I will say this. When, when you talk about Gibson and Lynn, you think you're going to get innings. And the truth is the rotation doesn't have a lot of depth. Like, if things don't work out, right, then you're going to go Zach Thompson in there, maybe one of the other young guys in there. Like, I do think the risk with Jack of not getting a lot of innings is a lot greater than – a Gibson or a Lance Lynn. Like, I do believe those guys will give you innings. Hopefully, they're good innings. Uh, well, you well, know what I mean? My, like, well, that's my issue is I don't think they're going to give you good innings. Well, we'll see. But I think if you got Jack and he gets hurt, you're really caught short with, with innings. Mm-hmm. I mean, just innings for that starting rotation. And I do think it was funny. I did see someone uh, tweeting out quotes from, uh, from Ollie and, uh, about – you know, the additions to the rotation. And he said, we like the personality those guys bring. And I'm thinking, no, that's good. But really what you want is quality innings. Yeah. Number one. And I'm sure he said it, so it was taken out of context. But I I do think those guys will bring that intangible. But I think it's fair to say what kind of innings are they going to give you. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, he he did a – I know he did his whole press conference. He also did the interview with Katie Wu – where he, he did talk about everything, but he did really mention and focus in on kind of the clubhouse stuff with Sonny Gray is a guy who wants to be elite, that you know they know Lance Lynn, obviously. He's been here before, brings that edge. Kyle Gibson is known throughout baseball as a great clubhouse guy. So he mentioned all those things. One of the most interesting things Mosaic has said uh, amid a, a, amidst a bunch of interesting things at winter meetings, talking about O'Neill officially being on the trade deadline, whatever, was how he insinuated that Sonny Gray and Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson all probably had better options elsewhere but wanted to be a part of the Cardinals. And it's interesting to hear Ollie talking about the personality of those guys. And not that I ever doubted Charlie when he said this, but it was just completely underscoring your point about how the Cardinals have a very specific personality that fits with them, and that's just kind of the way it is. Well, who's the reliever they got? Phil Matone or Phil Matten, one of the two. He's from Detroit. He's from Illinois. Oh, really? And so, look, <laughs> when I said that, I was half joking, but it is true. It is true. These are all 30 year old dudes coming to the Cardinals, and most of them live close by. And, and gonna... that's fine, by the way. You should, you, should, you should take advantage of that. There are dudes who live in Orange County who would probably prefer to play for the Dodgers or Angels or prefer to have spring training in the Phoenix area. Like all these people, they live different places, they want to do spring training in. Florida versus Phoenix or vice versa. So, and, I mean, they did want to pitch here, you know, because they signed early, right? They they yeah. wanted to string it along. They could have. And, you know, sometimes the market gets better. Sometimes it actually gets worse. But you play the game of musical chairs. If you are not – if it's not a location you wanted to go to, you're not signing that early. So that's your tell on that. Um, so we'll see how that works out. I, I, I still think they have a lot of work to do. I'm still hoping somewhere in the mix is an opportunity to maybe upgrade that starting rotation. I think some of the things Mo has said have kind of blunted that idea just a little bit. But on the other hand, 
I don't always take what someone in his position would say at the winter meetings as gospel because I guarantee they have some things they're looking at behind the scenes. And here's another thing that I think we probably didn't focus on enough this past season, and it's because the Cardinals were so bad, so I get it. But I think one of the reasons – so the Cardinals just did the Contreras deal. Then they kind of sat – they played the season out. Now, this was a huge miscalculation, but I truly believe the Cardinals' strategy was going to be the same as the previous two years. I believe they they didn't love their starting rotation at all. They knew it was a problem. I think they thought they could get to the trade deadline like the previous two years around 500 and improve. Now, that was a gross miscalculation. But I do think the Cardinals, if they were 52-52, and they would have added like they did the previous couple years with Quintana, Montgomery, Hap, Lester. And they have that very same opportunity this year. The Cardinals are not going to want to miss the playoffs two years in a row. And even though I like I like most of these signings, if Matt's is a starter, good chance he's hurt. What if what if one one of Kyle Gibson and Lance Lynn aren't working out a hundred games in? You have spots then to add at the trade deadline if you're in it. A lot of these teams recently at the trade deadline, they'll add big bullpen pieces. So if the Cardinals don't do much else in this winter. If they're still good, I actually believe that they'll make some moves at the trade deadline. And so when we talk about payroll, I do think we should include what they add at the deadline. It's just that this past year they were so freaking bad, they did something they never, ever do, which is actually sell off. I, and I agree with that, except I, I would hope that somewhere in there, what if the season starts as a disaster as it did last year? Now you mentioned, because their rotation is thin. I've said a million times, you think you need six, you're going to need nine starters. They don't have a lot of depth, and you have older guys in the rotation. That's why I'm hoping somewhere in there there's a deal to also get a dependable, solid starting pitcher in there because I think they might be a little light, especially if it unfolds like it did last year where a guy's hurt and another guy's hurt, and next thing you know, you got pitchers maybe you never heard of getting starts. And so this is why I think somebody like Zach Thompson is so important. And 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 people may gloss over this, but I didn't love the idea of getting rid of Dakota Hudson and Jake Woodford purely on a depth standpoint of what you said. Even if they're your eighth and ninth starters, there's going to be a time where somebody hits the IL and you're going to have to make four starts. And so Mosellock said this the other day when he did his meeting with the St. Louis reporters. He was being asked about the swing guys. And people always bring up somebody like a Colin McHugh. He's just that typical swing guy who can make some money. He can give you starts, but he's also a length guy to the bullpen. And he said those guys just don't exist as much because that's a role most of these guys want to be a starter or a reliever. Like the Seth Lugos of the world, for a while, Seth Lugo was super valuable because with the Mets, he could do anything. He could start and be good. He was their closer. He was a high-leverage reliever. Well, now he's a full-time starter. So there's not as many of these dudes out there that want to sign a free agent deal to be a swing man, which is why I think the fact that you had Dakota Hudson and Jake Woodford and now you still have Zach Thompson, I do think those guys are valuable even if they only throw 70 innings for you. Let me ask you, if Zach Thompson gets pushed into action as a starter and he's good, do I does that erase me picking him as a pick-to-click last year? No, because I don't want to do that. Because that, then that gets into... I'm just kidding. I Listen, I like, on. I like Zach Thompson. So he, he was good in the bullpen at the start of last year for like nine appearances. Then he had three. I remember doing a story on it. Then he had like three bad ones. All of a sudden, off to Memphis to be a starter. He didn't even understand what was happening. At Memphis, he couldn't throw strikes, and his velocity dipped a little bit. Now, they brought him back, and he was better, but he wasn't like that guy who was nailing down that spot in the rotation. But I still think he can be that guy. I really like him out of the bullpen, too. To be fair, because I truly don't remember, when you said that you were high on Zach Thompson last winter, wasn't that as a reliever? Yes. Okay. I don't think it's fair what the Cardinals did to Zach Thompson last year just as a pitcher in general. He was awesome. Remember we talked on the show about him being an all-star? We, we kind of 
That was, <laughs> that was probably me. No. In April All-Star? No, we chuckled about that. It's all good. But I'm saying he had a little rough stretch as a reliever. Th- really? Three? Right. Three outings. Very little. So they throw him back to the minors to be a starter. I think if you'd have kept Zach Thompson in the pen for the whole year, I think he would have been a solid, dependable reliever. And if you remember, and my memory isn't great, I think he had an up and down in there too where he was like, so what, what, what are they telling you? He's like, I don't know. Like, he didn't know. Like, he was a man without a role, which I think as a major leaguer, those players are creatures of habit. Yeah. They want to know exactly what the role is. And I know that flies in the face of some people. Like, your, your closer should be the guy you're bringing in the fourth if that's the biggest leverage situation. I'm not even discussing it. I'm talking about how players get comfortable in roles. They kind of want to know. Seventh inning, I start getting loose. You know, it's either the eighth or ninth. I think you get your best out of people when they know how they're going to be used. And I don't think Zach Thompson had a clue what was going on in terms of his usage. And that's where I think sometimes we don't focus on this enough. Let's be real about this. Imagine how pissed Zach Thompson probably was when that happened. Yeah. Think, of, think about it like this. Pitchers will redo their entire offseason plan based on whether they're going to be a starter reliever. Everything from how they run to how they lift to how they throw, everything is going to be dependent on, am I trying to build up to throw 180 innings? Am I trying to build up to throw back-to-back days, two out of three, three out of four, whatever it is? I mean, there's, there's literal different off-season training programs for this. And a month into the season, you could have done this at spring training if you wanted to try Zach Thompson as a starter. This also speaks to the fact that the Cardinals never thought they were going to be in this situation where everything imploded. And they were in panic mode. You never expected, I mean, Wayno's hurt and bad. Michaelis early on. Who else was hurt last year? Matt. Matt's is hurt. I mean, they all of a sudden just needed anybody. Then you got Woodford making starts. You got Dakota Hudson making starts. I promise you they did not want to screw up Zach Thompson. But Zach Thompson's entire 2023 was screwed up by the Cardinals. It just was. And this, is why, this is why I think he's a, like... Yes, I'm a simp and all. Uh, like I know a good guy. Zach Thompson's like, I'm like, dude, what, like, what's going on? And he's like, I really don't know. And <laughs> and he's like, I, I'll be honest, I have no idea. But he said, but I know I'm going to be a major league pitcher, and that's good. Mm. Like he's like, mm. he's like, I understand that there's things I'm not in control of, so I got to do what they want me to do. And he said when he went back down to Memphis, like it did mess with his head. All of a sudden, you're a starter, go, and it messed with him. But he got that under control. I, I'm, a, I'm a Zach Thompson fan. And here's another thing. So Zach Thompson last year, if, and I can read other stats, but just ERA, 4.29 as a reliever, that's not, that's not bad. 4.57 as a starter in nine starts. And we kind of look at him as, oh, it's Zach Thompson. I understand it's nine starts. That's essentially the ERA of Kyle Gibson. Yeah. And exa- it's much that's, better. That's my it's whole much point. better than Lance Lynn. And it's essentially the same ERA as Jack Flaherty last year. This is my whole point about all this: is that I would have rather taken the twenty-five million dollars or twenty whatever million dollars that you gave to a combined Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson, and put that into one good pitcher, and then just had Zach Thompson take the other spot. I think Zach Thompson plus good pitcher X is better than Kyle Gibson and Lance Lynn. Like who? Who did, who did you want that for that money? I. Uh, Truthfully, I don't know because a Blake Snell is going to cost more than that. Yamamoto is going to cost more Agreed. than that. So, so uh, a, a Sonny Glassnow. Gray, Sonny Gray too. Glassnow, who's got injury. Like, uh, I, I agree. I'm not in, a, in not him specifically in the idea, but that caliber. In the idea, I'm not disagreeing. But in reality, who would it have been? I, I don't know if the options are that great for that. But I will say it's it's a fair premise. E-Rod, if you have and if not, you have Sonny Gray. Who we'd say is a one, one A, two like let's call him a one A. I would say one if you're in the Cy, in the voting for Cy Young, you're right, you're you're a one. That's fair. Okay. So let's say you get a one A or a two, and then you get another I think that makes sense too, but I don't know who that guy would be. And in- so Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt. But I, I agree with your point in theory, Cole, but think about it like this. Okay. Because it's a one year deal. Let's just say Kyle Gibson or Lancelin get hurt. Don't you like the fact that Zach Thompson is your sixth starter as opposed to your fifth? 
Because yes, but I don't like that Miles Michaelis is my two instead of my three. No, I I a thousand percent agree with you. I'm just saying I think Zach Thompson as a swing man has tremendous value. Like if Zach Thompson hits free agency three four years from now as that guy, he'll be coveted because he can if he's a if he can be a four ERA reliever and starter. There's a lot of value to that guy. So even though I agree with you in theory, I think the fact that you're kind of you're kind of saying, all right, if Kyle Gibson's good, if Lance Lynn's good, it's fine. If they're not, it's a one year deal. It's not that much money, and we do have Zach Thompson there waiting in the wings to pick up that spot. And I and I the other side of that is when you have a starting rotation that averages 35. Is there a possibility of a repeat of last year where you're going to be caught short? Yes, and I think that's a real concern, and I'm a rights holder. And what also factors into this is if you make the playoffs, which would be fortunate, if you make it, you need you don't need the full five, but you need four. You need four starting pitchers, and Michaelis, Mats, and Lynn being three out of those four, I think completely flies in the face of your argument, Cat, that get to the playoffs and anything can happen. If, you're, if your starting rotation is that bad, I think that's really, really dangerous. So, but that goes back to Charlie's point. First... If they're good enough to be in the postseason, we don't know what those seasons will look like for those guys. Right. If they're not good enough and the Cardinals are in it, I agree with Charlie, then the Cardinals will use the trade deadline, the time before it, to upgrade that. We've seen them do it before. Sometimes they do it, and I'm thinking, oh, they're waving the white flag, and the guys we bring in are better than I ever thought they would be, like Lester and Half. Look at 2022. So whoever the rotation was when the season started, who were your playoff? They they basically threw three starters in the playoffs that series against the Phillies. Who were they? Game one was Quintana, yeah. who they acquired at the deadline. Game two was Miles Michaelis, who they pulled, I believe, after three or four innings. Immediately brought in Jordan Montgomery, who they also acquired at the trade deadline. Would have been game so, three, yeah. So again, I could be wrong. If the Cardinals are fifty-five and fifty-five at the deadline, I would be shocked if they did not pick up a starter at the deadline. That would probably be their number two starter in a playoff series. No, I don't think that's fair. And the fact, that, the fact that they're headed to the postseason amplifies that that's probably the way it would go. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't disagree with that at all. I think that's fair. My concern is if it's trouble from the get go with injuries or pitchers not performing, they're going to be in a tough spot because the last thing the Cardinals want is a repeat of how the season started last year, because that thing snowballed and got out of control. Yeah, I think the Cardinals' offense is pretty optimistic, so it just all comes down to the pitching for me. I, I know that last year they were a little bit weird with their offense where they would either bas- they would basically either score seven runs or two, and so if you didn't catch your really hot day, then you're probably losing that day. But I expect the offense to probably level out and be a little bit more consistent and – Oh man, I, I I just don't like where the pitching staff's at. I understand. And, I mean, and no I, one does. So I'm just parroting everything everyone and else. Ollie is saying. And Ali and uh, and Mo have both said they want players to actually have positions, uh, regular positions, yeah. which I think will help the defense too. Because, but then again, you have moving parts. You got Donovan. You got Tommy. You could be so there will be some of that. But once once you lock down guys in a position instead of rotating everyone like it's a big game of musical chairs. Usually you get better defense. And that's something that I was wrong about last year at the beginning of the year. It was kind of like the Cardinals were rotating. And I liked this idea, and now I disagree with it seeing how it went, where they were kind of rotating guys all the time. And all right, go, go, Somebody's going to win a job. Somebody's going to win a job. But when you rotate all the time, you don't really allow them to develop any consistency. And so shockingly, or unshockingly now, no one won a job because no one had the opportunity to be consistent. So you do, I think, for a period of time – have to commit to a lineup and then kind of play the feast or famine role from there. And the big question is, who's at second, who's in center? And they're telegraphing it basically saying Tommy's in center, right? Yeah. And And then Gorman slash Donovan. And Gorman will be at second base, and Donovan's going to be the super utility guy. Well, there is a DH. And you have the DH. Probably Gorman at DH. How'd it go, Hollywood? Damn good. There we go. Yeah, it was good, man. If we had it, I would have put it on so I could – <clears throat> Just see Cam Jansen phoning in. Yeah, it was see, good. see a little graphic. One little final point on the the starter thing because I do think this gets overlooked because we focus on okay Gibson and Lynn didn't have great ERAs. The innings matters in my opinion 
and and you do have to pay for the innings, even if the ERA is similar, let's say, to a Dakota Hudson. I know Jake Woodford had a bad year, but the Cardinals didn't have this deep bullpen. So if you're rolling out four inning pitchers versus guys who can go five or six, even if it's not a three ERA and it's a Cy Young guy, you're saving your pen. You're not having to ask your pen for 15 outs. And that's what Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson should bring you. They, they should keep you in the game. Even if they go six and allow three, okay, well, now we can set up our bullpen for maybe Zach Thompson, Geo, and Ryan Helsley if you're trying to win a game. And Ollie doesn't have to go, oh, my God, dude, I have to get 15 outs. That's what was happening last year. Every time a Dakota, a Woodford, I mean, think about Wayno. Wayno was getting booted after two innings. You should listen to uh, to my YouTube channel and the interview with Lance Lynn where he talks about giving up so many homers and how he'll be different this year, what was going on with him. I thought it was kind of interesting. Also, I don't know if you see, again, I'm not at the winter meeting, so I'm not hearing anything. I'm reading other people's reporting. But uh, supposedly the Cardinals are one of the teams interested in bringing Hicks over or back. I would be on board with that. Yeah. I mean – they need another piece at the end of games. I was hoping it would be Joe Kelly. Apparently, he had a deal with with uh, with the Dodgers, but again, I think because he was in Hawaii, he didn't have a chance to get his physical. I think that's what's holding it up. Do we know the money on that? No, I hadn't seen that. But if you recall, it's happened days ago yeah. that the reports were they were close to a deal or they have a deal in principle, but it hasn't been officially put out there by the Dodgers, and it's my belief he was on the beach in Maui, and he wasn't coming back to, to do a physical, so they had to wait for him to come back from Hawaii before he has his physical. That'd be my guess. So Jim Bowden says a couple days ago, the deal with the Dodgers is one year, $8 million. So that's a lot. And Hicks, Hicks is going to get multi-years, I would think, for that or more, don't you think? Don't you think Hicks could get – he's super young. Yeah. He's one of the youngest – Free agents out I there. I think two. Not, not, not beyond that. But I bet you he could get it. Isn't, he, isn't he 26 years old? I bet you he could get a three-year deal. I'll, I'll, I'll bet it's two, but we'll see. And with uh, I asked Kelly about coming to the Cardinals, and he said they're scared of his arm trouble. <laughs> they're scared of his arm trouble. Oh, of his tr- arm trouble. Yeah. Jordan Hicks. Okay. Jordan Hicks is 27. Just turned 27. Ken Rosenthal reports Craig Kimbrell is close to finding a deal with the Orioles. Cardinals draft in seventh overall. Seventh overall, baby. And if you think I know a darn thing about draft prospects. Guardians got number one? Did. Wrong. Yeah, Guardians got number one. Brad Paisley was, I think, the special guest card reader or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that. I, I don't know what purpose he you know, served or why they— my thing about the draft <laughs> position. He's a country singer. So the Cardinals— Oh, I had, love him. The Cardinals had a shot to be in the top five. I do. And they're seventh. So, I mean, if you're not number one— who is so sure that the number three guy is going to be much different than the seventh? Like, no one really knows that. So seventh is fine. Yeah. Especially when none of us pay attention to high school and college baseball anyway. But even those that do have no idea how it's going to translate. Like, you, you could go up and down the NFL draft or the NBA draft or NHL and see guys who are picked high that never amount to anything. You know why? Because it's hard to gauge that. I know. It's not an exact science. And, you, and I think it's tougher going from, like, uh, college or high school and then into pros, even at the minor league level. It's a whole different thing that you're going through. Yeah. Going Apparently, though, last year, and I agree, I don't know any of these dudes, but everybody said last year was this rare year where there were five dudes who could have went number one in other years. But this particular year is not the same. That's what a lot of these draft Knicks basically said, that last year's draft was crazy. Well, Holiday's kid who they just said he wants to be in the majors this year and they're going to give him every opportunity, and he dominated minor league baseball. That seemed like a can't miss, and guess what? It was. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, cool. And his other kid is probably going to be the number one pick. That's insane. It's insane. <laughs> Terrible genetics. Just like uh, three uh, Hughes brothers played against each other. All got to play Imagine Holiday's game. kid. He Man. played second base and short, and they're projecting him as a shortstop. Ethan? The 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 kid who's in the I forget which Jackson one. Jackson Jackson. Ooh. So Ethan's big. I bet you Ethan. I would guess he sticks at third or moves to first. Can you imagine though having 
like a power hitting shortstop that can do everything. Lefty. Like the like Cal Rip. Oh yeah. Damn. Dude. Again, if you're a baseball dork, you should watch that home run derby video. I saw a little bit of it's it. It's amazing. Yeah. I I tweet I retweeted one of them. I don't know if it was that one or some and people are like, big deal, metal bats. No, it's it makes it more fun. Come on. And then I got into that account. I'd never watched them. They have these dudes who are like good JUCO baseball players, and they were good in you know small colleges, and they became this Bat Bros is a huge account, and they get juiced up bats, and they go to high elevations like Jackson Hole and yeah. hit 580 foot bombs. Yeah, yeah, I saw. And that. try to set records. That's why I I came in here one time. And I go, what do you think the record is in the last 20 years of uh, home run? Uh, and I think it's it's pretty low. And these guys are smashing them. In MLB? Yeah, in MLB. Yeah, apparently the stat cast record in the last 20 years is 505. Yeah, these and guys you are you know who did it? It might have been, remember C.J. Crone versus the Cardinals? C.J. Crone hit a ball against the Cardinals. I want to say that was 500. Really? But five, I think 581 would bat minor league game like 40 years ago. Yeah, some guy in the minors hit one and just smoked it. 